This talk is about how our localization system that we've been working on and iterating on the past few years uh, works. This is something that I don't believe we have given before. And so I have only, I've left a fair amount of room in this presentation for audience interaction and for questions and that sort of thing. As for who I am, since I didn't include an intro slide, my name is James Kuzma. I was on the team 2011 to 14 and have come back as a mentor. I currently work at uh, Blue River Technology with a couple of other um, 971 mentors. And yeah, so I've been helping out with uh, the localization stuff for the past couple of years. For context, to answer the question of what do I mean when I say localization, broadly speaking, it's how a robot or device figures out where it is in space. For first robotics, this means how do we figure out where we are in the field? Um, exact, yeah. In the broader scheme of things, this can include things like if you have a factory robot, it needs to know where it is on the factory floor. If you have a self-driving car, it needs to know where it is on the road. Um, and so as a broad topic, it is relevant in a lot of different important areas. There are, because of this, there's also a lot of different methods surrounding this. And so the stuff I'll be talking about here has applicability beyond just FRC, but it is far from the only set of methods that are being used. So first bit of audience interaction. Why would we care about localization in the context of FIRST Robotics? Autonomous path following. OK. It's, it's a little hard to do anything impactful when you're doing it in the wrong place. A little hard to. What do you mean by that? If, if the robot doesn't know where it is, it's really hard to shoot baskets and perform other tasks that you can do it. OK, to, so to speed up or to improve your ability to do game tasks. OK. Uh, for the driver, probably a lot easier. Um, like I remember, on the on the far side of the field, pretty hard to know where your robot is because of the, all the obstruction. Yeah. Autonomous. All right. So the, the similar thing around autonomous uh, platform. Any others? Yeah. Like auto aim, knowing how far you're from the hoop. Yep. You might have covered my full list. I don't. I can know. <laughs> um. So yeah, we've got autonomous mode. You care about, if you care about being able to do stuff in autonomous, it is helpful to know where you are. Obviously, people were able to write autonomous modes for a long time in FRC's history without explicitly knowing where you are in the field beyond the fact that you knew that you started in the same place on the field. Um, which you could argue is localization, but isn't generally what people mean. Um, you've got various types of aiming or driver assists where you need to, yeah, the driver can, they can see where the robot is on the field most of the time. Um, and so they can, in theory, do a lot of game tasks, but they may not be able to do it quickly. Um, there is, everyone likes to throw, well, not everyone, a lot of people like to throw around the, oh, what if we can make a FRC robot fully autonomous? Um, that has limitations, but it's something that people like to throw around, and it's always fun to keep in mind. And lastly, we do like to challenge ourselves. Um, this may or may not be obvious from the robots in 971 builds, but it is nice to have something interesting to work on, but we try not to let that dominate everything because you do want to, when you are designing a piece of software or designing anything, you want to keep in mind why you are actually doing that. And in this case, we do try to keep in mind why we actually care about localizing the robot. And that becomes very relevant in the design of some of the algorithms and especially for a couple of years just to cover how we've used this in the past, or what, what we've done in the past at a high level. In 2019, the game objective was to place uh, circular hatches and these round balls onto targets. So in this case, there were a couple of retroflective pieces of tape above each target. There are a couple of strips of Velcro that you could attach the hatch panel to. Um, and then you could also place the uh, ball in there. So that meant that what we needed was driver assistance to help with that placement, because especially for the hatch panel placement, it was actually required a relatively high degree of precision for most his game tasks historically, because those pieces of Velcro were only around two inches wide. Um, 
And to actually implement this, we used uh, four, I believe, uh, Javois, which we don't use anymore, but for vision processing with infrared LEDs and cameras to detect the retroflective tape while trying to avoid dealing with the, we were trying to, with infrared LEDs, we were trying to see if we could not create blinding green LEDs all around the robot. You'll see we do not actually do this anymore, but um, we did do that. And we detected the targets. And we did some algorithms that resemble what we do now and I'll talk about later. In 2020 and 2021, the main game task that cared about localization or the such was shooting balls into the goal on the left. The way that, yeah, oh, and for our autonomous since that year, well, and in 2019, we also used it for the autonomous, but it had some issues at times. Um, that year, rather than using the retroreflective tape, which for reference was, if I remember right, a sort of V under this hexagonal goal, we took advantage of SIFT to detect various features around the goal. So for instance, that, that goal that we were using in um, the cafeteria here for some practice used partially a uh, actual game graphic, but we also just put some colored tape all over the goal because that generated SIFT features and we couldn't be bothered to print out that much game graphics. Um, that had certain benefits in terms of how that performed um, and in terms of some of the flexibility. It also meant that we were relying on the fact that first had graphics that could be detected. That year we used Raspberry Pis. Since we were using SIFT, we did not need green LEDs or infrared LEDs or anything to detect the uh, tape. And then this last year in 2022, we also used, it's basically the same deal as 2021. We used it for our autonomous. Um, we use this to improve our ability to shoot at the goals. Um, we still use Raspberry Pis, essentially the same platform as 2020 and 2021, with the exception that we added green LEDs, uh, because first in their infinite wisdom, put up some nice retroflective tape as they have historically done, but there are no field graphics that could be readily detected. And so we could not go to using that same SIFT algorithm that we had previously. Um, and yeah, so we added these LEDs, we had four vision cameras on the robot, plus a driver camera, which did not have green LEDs and was not relevant for localization. And on top of that, we built a uh, board to make use of the analog devices 16505 IMU, which is just a slightly newer revision of the 16470 that I believe you can currently get through first choice. Uh, we had some issues with how we were using that IMU. Uh, in particular, because we wanted to place the IMU near the center of mass of the robot, and because the Robo Rio was not near the center of mass of the robot, we had a relatively long SPI run, and we encountered issues with uh, EMI that the IMU did not perform well under, that I can go into more detail, but may or may not be interesting to the group here. Um, yeah. So. I've talked about some of what we did and some of the sensors that we used, but if we want to do a localization, what sensors might we use to achieve this? Uh, gyroscope? Okay. Encoders. Okay. Oh, by the way, does, does everyone know what is meant by, I guess, both gyroscope and encoders? Okay, great. Um, anything else? Yeah. Accelerometer? Yeah. Vision? Yep, vision. Oh, and to repeat for the audio, people have said encoders, gyroscopes, accelerometers, and vision. Anything else? LiDAR. Yep. Uh, magnetometers? I don't know if they're working. Yeah, so LiDAR and magnetometers um, are not as relevant within FIRST Robotics, and I include a couple of these because they are not as, but just to give some broader context. So yes, an IMU with an accelerometer and gyroscope you can use to get sort of inertial readings that essentially allow for high rate um, inputs as to what the robot is doing. But because of the nature of those sensors, they will tend to drift over time. You can have drivetrain encoders to tell you how far the drivetrain wheels have moved. That is 
subject to issues with drift though, whether that is your wheel spinning or you being pushed sideways or any combination thereof. Cameras with known targets, so basically what FRC has historically done where you have a well-defined target that you are trying to identify. Um, I include here a picture of some April tags, which is what they will be adding to the field next year. Um, yeah? Yeah, I know, I know that's not, it's not quite relevant for FRC, but sonar also. Yep. People have used sonar in FRC in the past. It has become less common to my knowledge. Um, but for things like, I don't know how successfully people used it, to be quite honest, but you could try to detect like how far away the driver station wall was if you wanted to drive closer. Um, to be quite honest, in most cases, people were probably better served by just using drivetrain encoders. Um, but yeah. Um, and yes, things that I am not aware of as being used as much in FRC, you, we have discussed at times trying to use sort of the same optical flow that you sort of see in computer mice to detect how the field is moving. Um, the optics of that turn out to be tricky. Um, yeah, Phil? You mean like looking at the carpet? Yes. Or Yes, so that the idea would be you look at the carpet and that way you can see how the robot is moving without being subject to wheel slip. Um, since I'm mentioning that, people have also used follower wheels where you sort of put a wheel on the ground um, but don't power it so it's not going to spin or it's not going to uh, slip, it will spin, um, and then put encoders on that. You could use LiDAR in some way. People have used that to some degree in FRC but it's not been adopted significantly. Um, GPS is not really applicable within a first or box context because you are virtually all events these days are indoors and even on the rare occasions events have been held outdoors it is not in a good environment for GPS and the FRC field is not a good scale for GP well not a good scale for consumer grade GPS um, <laughs> but those are things that might be used are used for instance in self-driving cars or just outdoor robotics in general um, and you can come up with all sorts of other things. So, but we also have some challenges in an FRC environment. We are not big companies with tens of millions of dollars to spend on whatever we want. Um, and we also don't have a huge amount of time in a given season. We, we find out what the field is at the start of January. Then we have to actually build a robot. If we're, I mean, who cares if you have fancy localization if your robot can't do anything um, or if you don't have one built yet. So you need to go through all of that and then you need to find time to actually do this. It is a very hard to control environment. Um, the, for instance, in 2019, we had to, the, the, those vision targets, these two pieces of retroflective tape were put on by hand, typically. And so the angle at which they were put onto the target was not always correct, um, or did not always match the field spec. And so we had to solve that, we ended up actually generally going on and measuring the field before each of our events and offering to help the field staff to correct anything that is grossly out of alignment. But you can't always do that. You may not always be in a situation where that is a reasonable option. Um, yeah, uh, there may be bad lighting. We encountered some issues this year because we were relying on the retroflective tape where if we did the, if the doors for a venue are open and so exterior sunlight comes in that can significantly affect what exposure you want to set on your cam cameras. Um, it's just tricky. It's an adversarial environment. Everyone's not trying to work with you unless it's 2015. Um, but you, you have other robots that'll hit you, that'll try to mess you up. They may not, they may not be deliberately trying to mess up your localization, but they'll be pushing you around. They don't want you to win the game. Um, so you have to deal with that. And it's hard to test. Even if you have a perfect practice field, it's not the same lighting environment. You probably don't have exactly the same game graphics set up. You probably don't have a perfect field. You probably have a wooden field of that. We don't have any permanent field set up currently. So it can be very hard to test correctly. That is all the challenges. Well, not all the challenges probably, but all the ones that I thought to list on the slide. So, what are we going to do in choosing uh, the solution we put together? Focus, I, since I mentioned it earlier, I'll mention it again. Focus on what you actually care about for the localization. The goal is not necessarily to have your, X, your XY coordinates that you output from your algorithm most closely match where the robot is on the field. 
there are situations where that may matter. In autonomous, that matters because if your autonomous needs to go pick up a ball that is on the field somewhere at a known XY location, then you need to actually be able to go and pick up that ball correctly. But if you are trying to shoot into a goal, your robot needs to know where it is relative to the goal to correctly align your shooter. It doesn't need to know its XY position. In 2019, if you're trying to place a hatch panel on the rocket ship or put a ball, whatever, cargo in the rocket ship or cargo ship, uh, you need to know where your robot is or rather where the game piece that you're trying to place is relative to where you are trying to place it. You also, in that case, you also did not care where you were on the field per se. Um, but it's useful to know because that affects, that makes it easier to build the rest of the algorithms. But there's times when, for instance, especially this year, our robot may not have the, if you look at the visualization we had on our, um, for a robot that showed where it thought it was on the field, that might not have been correct. But it would have been relatively correct for where it thought it was relative to the goal that it was trying to shoot balls into. You need to figure out what sensors you will have available or what sensors you will need to add. Um, if you aren't going to be able to add a bunch of cameras, like we add four or five cameras, depending on what we're trying to do to the robot, that's a lot of work to add. You may not have that, you may not be able to easily do that. You may just choose to put on a limelight, um, a single limelight, and set that up using reasonably standard settings and get good uh, values for where the target is relative to your robot. And that may be what you're, you have available. Um, and, but you may also realize, oh, we, don't, we aren't even planning for use, having any sort of vision. Well, maybe we should plan differently. And then figure out how you're going to test and debug it. If you build an algorithm, if you put it all together as best you can, and then when you arrive on the field at your event, it goes horribly wrong, and you have no idea what happened, you don't have time to debug that. You have a half hour to one hour calibration period where you can bring your robot on the field if you even have your robot functional at the time where you cannot enable the robot and there will be other teams using the field and it may be at a bad time of day for the lighting that i mentioned earlier you'll have practice matches and you'll have real matches <laughs> you don't want to be testing in real matches although you may have to <laughs> um Practice matches in the calibration period, if the robot is, has a mechanical issue, it's probably not going to be available to use during that time. And even then, it's not a great environment for testing. So some of the things that we focus on are like having good logging so that after a match or after something goes wrong, we can go back and look at that to figure out what went wrong. We also try to have decent visualizations during a match or when stuff is going on to figure out so that we can quickly assess what went wrong. And then before you ever get to an event, you want ways to test things. That's why we had this target. That's why we included a bit of the real field graphics because we wanted to make sure the real field graphics would actually work with this algorithm. Um, and we focused on making sure we had the key things in that setup. We had the target and we had the shape of the target that we cared about. Um, we, don't, we didn't care about the rest of the driver station wall, so we didn't include it. Yeah. And then you need to actually do something. Yes. So the reason why you put many colors of tape and the real thing is trying to trip up your robot so you can, if there's anything wrong, you can fix that before the actual match? Oh, we weren't trying to trip it up per se. We were just trying to have something that was easy to put together that met our need or that was a reasonable approximation as far as the vision algorithms were concerned of the real um, vision targets. Which, where in this case, what mattered for making a reasonable approximation was not being a featureless piece of wood. Well, it just needed some features, in this case, random color pieces of tape, um, to roughly approximate what we would see on the field. Okay. So in 2022, what did we care about? We needed to provide an XY position so that we could follow our splines in autonomous, which was important to be able to pick up the balls accurately to the case I was mentioning earlier. We did not have any cameras pointed down at the ground to identify the balls, so we could not rely on doing, you could conceptually not care about the XY position and just focus on seeing where the balls actually are. We were not doing that, so we needed to know, we needed to have a decent XY position. 
And then during teleop and during autonomous, we needed to have an accurate relative pose to where the goal was so that we could shoot balls into the goal. It needed to be robust because we'd be under a lot of defense. Um, it would need to be robust to losing vision of the target. Uh, ideally, it would be something that could work while the robot is moving so that we could shoot while moving. That is something that requires more effort to test and we did not get that perfectly working. Um, but it's, it's sort of, you want to keep in mind what the potential use cases are. And we wanted to build on this for future years. Uh, this is something that we tend to keep in mind a fair amount of, there are things we will experiment with in one year that we don't think we'll get perfect that year, but then we'll use that to build on for the next year. And so this year like that, I am you board that I mentioned down in the bottom left. That's a lot of work to do just for one year. We weren't doing it just for one year. We were doing that to set ourselves up for the next couple years. Um, and same thing with, uh, that's true of basically all of this. All of this, a lot of this work can be reused year to year. Some of the specific stuff like, oh, we set things up to detect this particular target is harder to reuse. But a lot of the rest of the stuff I just discussed in this presentation can be. Yes. So. Um um, of course, we're talking about reusability between years to years, yeah. and of course, in the game manual, there's talk, they talk about how you're not supposed to um, re uh, reuse uh, like mechanical elements yep. every year. But like, what, where does the line, um, what, where, where does the line stop and, and start? So, stuff like this? so for software, um, oh well, so there's electrical stuff which I'll touch on, but just for soft, the question was, uh, how do the rules about uh, reusing components from year to year affect some of this? For software, as long as you open source your software before the start of the season, you can reuse all the software you open sourced. So we do that. This, we've become better about making that actually usefully open sourced in recent years. Um, we used to just release tarballs, but now we actually um, replicate our code onto GitHub. Um, for mechanical stuff, which would include electrical in this case, you need to release your designs. Um, our designs for our electrical boards end up in our software repository. Our mechanical designs end up on our website, I think, still, yeah. Um, but you cannot reuse something that you actually manufactured. So our electrical boards, we have to remanufacture after the start of the season. But for software, it is not really that big a deal because we can just release the code. Yes? You had said that um, you chose to go with uh, localization for, you know, for retrieving each of the balls during autonomous yeah. versus using like vision for seeing where's the ball. And yep. What was the, was that something you considered? What was like the thought? Yeah. So, so the question was, um, did we actually consider and what was our thought process around directly detecting the balls to pick up during autonomous versus relying on um, localization to go to the right place? It's not something we considered too heavily. I think we did discuss it briefly. Um, it would have added extra complexity in order to set up the algorithms to detect both the balls and to detect the target. Um, and we were, since, I mean, historically, we've been able to run autonomouses without specific localization to pick up game pieces. Um, and so we weren't too concerned about that being a major issue. However, I could easily see in the future that would make, the tuning the time is much less finicky to actually do that. So I think it's something that as, as time progresses and we're more able to just say reuse vision algorithms for detecting targets, we may repurpose some of our efforts towards detecting game pieces or such. Did you have a question or were you? Okay, couldn't tell if anyone else is raising their hand. Yeah, I think I covered all this slide. So since you're in hardware, we had drive training coders as we have every year for over a decade. Um, we had that IMU. Um, one notable thing about that board was that as part of making this robust, it also, rat so this talked to the full stream of IMU data was going to Raspberry Pi, which processed it into the algorithm. The, it also broke out a couple of PWM signals, which went straight to the Robo Rio for what the current gyro rate was and what the current integrated heading was from that gyro rate. The reason for that was if the Raspberry Pi sets are still a somewhat experimental platform and also a potential source of failure. And so 
by have completely bypassing them, that gave us the basic signals we need for other parts of our robot to function. Um, even if the Raspberry Pis went down or that part of the network went down or whatever. Um, the main reason for us caring about the gyro in particular is that is what we have, that is both the highest value um, dimension of the INU for us. And it's what we've used to improve our teleoperated driving um, algorithms historically. So our, uh, that code has not changed in a while. So we still want that as an input to, so that the driver can uh, drive as well as they can. And four cameras mounted each 90 degrees offset on our turret. So this meant that one camera was the one that was sort of pointing the same direction the catapult would shoot. The others were pointed in different directions. Um, each camera had its own Raspberry Pi. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a driver camera that was not too relevant here. Um, there, is, there was actually yet another Raspberry Pi that's the one connected to the IMU that fused all the results. And as I was mentioning earlier, we were detecting the retroflective tape. Yes? Um, I guess something slightly off topic, yep. but um, at the beginning, you are talking about how you used a six wheel West Coast drive. Is there yep. any reason you used West Coast drive instead of Swerve? It's what we have historically done, and changing that would have been hard. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, a, that's something where it's, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, FRC teams have resource constraints. <laughs> you can't do everything. Um, so There are discussions about that, as always. To give a different view of what our hardware platform looked like, we had cameras. They were going into the camera pies. They were then talking over Ethernet to a localizer Raspberry Pi, which then sent its results to the Robo Rio. There's also a sensor board, that was the one I showed earlier, that took in, actually, I didn't mention it earlier, but it also took in the encoders. Um, the sensor board then sent over SPI the encoders and um, IMU readings to the Raspberry Pi, and then over a PWM signal and a just normal encoder signal, it sent the gyro yaw rate and the encoders themselves to the uh, RoboRio. Any questions on this? Yeah. Small question. Do you have then like a, a switch, a network switch on your robot yes. and all the RPIs? And yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, there's a network switch in here that I just sort of ignore. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it, exactly is the, the camera files? What do they process from the cameras to send to the localizer? Yeah, so they take the raw images and they produce a estimate of where the robot or where the camera, sorry, is relative to the target that they are seeing. Um, and then they send that estimate to the uh, localizer pod. And one thing that actually is important that I forgot to put on this slide is we also dual purpose the driver camera pie as a logging pie. And so on that, we log a reduced rate set of full resolution images. So if, for instance, we are seeing issues during a match that we think might be related to, say, exposure settings, we can pull off the logs later and look at random images and see, oh, does it look like the exposure was reasonable in these? Um, we do not have the disk bandwidth disk. <laughs> bandwidth on that uh, pie to log full rate images. Um, but we do do that as well. Yeah? Uh, at what rate are you like, sampling all the sensors? And how long is each localization cycle? I guess, or how so most of the stuff on, I'll, I'll work backwards actually, most of the stuff on the RoboRio runs at 198 hertz because that's how quickly uh, PWM commands get sent out from the RoboRio. Then on the localizer, the, it, it's sending out results at that rate. Well, yes, it's sending out results at that rate because just to match the same rate. Um, camera images are coming in at a less deterministic rate. I think we were, probably shouldn't quote me on this. We were probably on the order of 10 to 20 hertz this year. They said 30 hertz at the vision clock. That sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> um, the IMU, we had set to read at uh, two kilohertz, and the encoders are being, well, they're encoders. So the, the 
encoders are being sampled whenever it is relevant. So for the Pi, it was happening at two kilohertz because it was batching that data with the IMU. Um, oh, and I didn't repeat the comment earlier. Apparently the vision talks had 30 hertz for the cameras. Um, and the Robo Rio is paying attention to the gyro and encoder readings at two, at 198 hertz. Phil. How did they arrive at 198 hertz? Phil asked why the Robo Rio operates at 198 hertz. I do not know the answer to that question. <laughs> this is, the 198 hertz has been the case for a while. Um, I assume it's a consequence of some decision in how the Robo Rio or maybe even the C-Rio, for all I know, was set up. Um, and software components. I did not make a pretty diagram for this. Sorry. Um, basically, it, for the most part, the information flows pretty linearly, um, with the exception of the, getting the, the sort of bypass the Robo-Rio there. Um, we have the sensors on various pies for detect, reading the IMU and vision things. Uh, I will not talk in too much detail about the vision stuff because there was another presentation about that and I'm not the expert on it. Um, the localization, which is the main topic of this presentation, um, which includes a sort of down estimator, which consumes uh, IMU readings, both gyro and accelerometer to estimate the current orientation or mostly which direction is down on the robot, as well as a hybrid extended Coleman filter uh, to calculate the, to do the localization of what the current drivetrain position is. Then there is the drivetrain control loop on the Robo Rio, which has a odometry only, sort of no vision, only gyro rates from the IMU localizer, um, which is used when, basically is used when we don't get readings from the main localizer, as well as all the drivetrain control code for autonomous, the spline following controller, all that. For aiming, and this, uh, this year was auto aiming code. In 2019, it was auto track. Well, actually in 2019, all the co relevant code was in the drivetrain for the game task because the way that needed to work was guide the robot as it drives into the goal. Um, but then, we'll but basically step four in each, any given year will be some sort of actually use these readings to get the robot to do the game task. And then we have locking the visualization. Any question about that series of? Yeah. Is there a explain following this again? Yeah, sure. I don't go into much detail on that. I don't think we've had any presentations on this in the past, so I wouldn't expect much context. The question was about spline following. Um, in order, the way that we choose to do our autonomous paths is we construct splines, and I will not be able to remember the exact precise terms. Um, for what sorts of splines, but splines that let you can draw out relatively readily on a simple UI that we've made um, and which then the robot can follow in autonomous that tends to produce reasonable paths or reasonably smooth and continuous paths for the robot to follow. Um, and that's, that then needs to consume X, Y position of the robot in order to be able to know what feedback to apply. Um, yeah. I can go into more detail on that towards the end if people are interested, um, but it's not the main topic of this presentation. All right, what is the down estimator since I referred to that vaguely? The robot isn't going to be um, nice and level during uh, a match. This is a somewhat extreme case from 2016. In most years, similar things can happen, although perhaps less frequently in 2016, because in 2016 you were going over these bumps constantly. Um, and so because of that, it is, especially if you want to try to use accelerometer readings, um, you need to know how the robot is oriented. For this, we've implemented an unscented Coleman filter, which is a way of doing a nonlinear Coleman filter since the orientation of the robot and the readings we have are not linearly related. And attempt to estimate what direction is down. We're basically borrowing the logic from this paper that I cited with some data cleaning on the inputs uh, to make it so that it only runs the corrections in certain circumstances. Um, do I have another slide on? Okay, yeah. 
And basically the way it works is when you are, the robot is reasonably still, it will use accelerometer readings to see what direction is down. Uh, this is important even if we think we're level because the, neither the robot nor the venue nor the INU will all be mounted perfectly. So it won't necessarily read by default that it is exactly zero in the XY plane or XY axis of the INU. Um, and then we use gyro readings to detect how we think the robot is turning in all three axes. The, in order to actually get this to work, first off, this is something that you will probably be familiar with if you try to use the gyro on your robot, but you do need some amount of calibration of the IME readings. The gyro will not have zero bias to start, so you need to calculate the bias of the gyro. This is very common for people to do already, um, if they're even if they're just using the yaw rate. Um, and the accelerometer readings need an estimate of gravity. Um, this is both because local gravity will vary by some degree, in different parts of the Earth, uh, but also because the sensors aren't perfect, which is probably the more important aspect. Um, <laughs> but if, if you look at how much gra local gravity does vary, it actually is significant to some degree. So in terms of the readings you want to get. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it tells the case that while moving, you will tend to experience high accelerations relative to gravity. Um, which make it hard to use it as a baseline for how much the, for exactly where the robot, how the robot is oriented while it's moving. And so you have to rely on sort of the gyro readings to integrate where you think the robot is oriented. This is something that we are actively trying to improve because if you are continually moving for 30 seconds, then you'll get enough drift in the gyros that that can actually start to cause problems if you want to use the accelerometer data. Um, for whatever reason, I'm just calling this out if anyone tries to replicate this. The unscented Coleman filter in question doesn't seem to do a great job of dealing with yaw. So I've actually just implemented, integrated that separately. Um, and this is just a link to some of the code if you're trying to follow up with this presentation later. Any questions on that? I use, I, for instance, refer to an unscented Coleman filter, which I don't know that most people will know what that is. Or you can just look it up on your own time. Okay, great. A Coleman filter on its own is a, if you have a linear system, which means something particular, um, with Gaussian noise, which also means something particular, a Coleman filter will be the optimal way to estimate the current state of that system. That is actually a reasonably correct model for how things work for something like a shooter wheel or um, the drivetrain if you simplify the model a lot and you assume that it doesn't like bounce around or the such or something like an elevator. The orientation of the robot is not linear. So what I mean by that is if you know what the, if the robot is pitched upwards by five or six degrees, then you can't apply a linear transform. You can't just multiply by a matrix to get what the uh, IMU readings will be when it is pitched like that. Because the accelerometer readings when you're pitched will be a function of the sine or cosine or whatever of the angles. Um, and so you need a method to establish where the, to figure out a good estimate of how the orbit is oriented given these readings. And so the most com one of the more common things to do in this sort of situation is to abuse a Coleman filter. Um, a Coleman filter is only optimal in the narrow conditions I was mentioning earlier, but it turns out it's a pretty good estimator, a pretty good way to estimate how things are working in most other situations, in a lot of other situations. An unscented Coleman filter is one of the many ways to try to do that. Um, the, do I have a reasonably blank slide? There's one back here somewhere. There we go. Um, the approximate way that an unsensitive Coleman filter works is it says, okay, we have some, we'll start by saying, okay, we have some estimate of how inaccurate our estimate of where the robot is right now. Um, if we just have that on an XY plane, because that's easy to draw on a whiteboard, um, you might say that that's our nominal estimate of where the robot is. And then you apply, if you know that your X, in the x dimension, you are off by plus or minus one, you think. You might generate points here 
in here. And I'm telling you why you think you're off by plus or minus two. So you generate points here and here. What you then do is if you, if knowing the current voltages you're applying to the drive chain motors and all of that that's going on in your system, you think that the whole robot is going to move by one or say five in the, I called this Y apparently, in the Y direction. <laughs> um, then you will generate a new estimate that is over here. And because your model is inaccurate, you'll also have some function they use to calculate the uncertainty. And so you'll probably say the uncertainty will grow a bit. So maybe now the velocity of the robot will also be a state in this. So technically, it's, uh, there's another couple dimensions going on, which makes it very hard to draw. Um, but the effect will be the same. You'll, you'll say that, OK, if the, for this point, when you generate it, effectively, you're assuming the robot is traveling faster than you thought. And so what will happen is not that you'll explicitly add some noise, but that the new point will be farther over here because the robot was traveling faster. And this point will be farther over here because the robot was traveling slower. And maybe these points won't have any additional noise because you're assuming that there's no lateral motion of the robot, or maybe there will be because you are modeling that. And then you'll end up with a higher noise estimate. The benefit of this is that it doesn't require you to try to model how the noise evolves as linear. You're just letting the model do the work for you. You're adding in some noise to your original estimate of where the robot is or where your system is. And then you're just running those new points through your model and seeing how they change. And then as a result, you can see, okay, they've moved farther apart. That means that there's a lot of uncertainty, there's more uncertainty. And so you can sort of collapse this into a new uncertainty matrix using the methods that you'll find if you look up an unsensitive Coleman filter. Um, or maybe it's a case that you, your model is such that you know that the robot is slowing down. And so maybe this will actually, or maybe, or sorry, that's, that's a poor example. Maybe your robot is attached to a spring that's attached to the center of the field. Um, and so what will happen is over time, your robot will be pulled towards the center of the field. And so all these points will also get pulled towards the center of the field. And that means they'll all converge into a single point that is much smaller. And so you'll know that the noise estimate reduced. Um, and we can also apply this to just if the states instead of being robot position are uh, the quaternion that represents the robot's orientation, which is what we use for the down estimator, then you can do a similar type of thing. Did that make any sense? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe that's something we should look up uh, offline. <laughs> Uh, I'll encourage that for future reading, and I'll make a note of that as something to potentially cover as a future Spurn series time. Maybe that made enough sense to at least when you go back and read it again, it'll help, or maybe it won't. We will find out. It'll be exciting. A new type of Coleman filter. <laughs> so, <laughs> an extended Coleman filter is a different way of handling nonlinear systems. Um, to a first approximation, what all this is doing is saying you have some measurements. You can do some math that corresponds to extended Coleman filter or the unscented Coleman filter or whatever. And then you can use it and you have some model of what you think the robot's going to do. Um, and you can update what you think. You can run your model for what you think the robot's going to do. You get a new estimate. You can then run another function that says, what do you think the measurements should be? So if you think the robot has gone forward one meter, the encoder should read one meter larger, or as if it's gone one meter forward. Um, if the encoders actually read 1.1 meters, then you, that difference can be used to perform a correction based on the math you will find if you look up these things, or if you read our code. Um, the way that this extended Coleman filter gets set up, um, we have a sort of a plant input, sort of this is this is referring to the model of the robot, sort of how we think the robot will move over time. Drive chain voltage is an input to that because that's what determines how the robot will move. Um, the plant output, so the output of the model, and then being, this is somewhat counterintuitive, but I'm trying to be consistent with what you'll find in other places. Um, the outputs of the model will be the drive chain encoders, the gyro yaw rate, and where we think the robot is. Um, 
at least, or, or sorry, where we think the cameras are relative to the targets, which is close to where we think the robot is. Um, but the cameras are not in the center of the robot. And our states are all these things. The main, it's x, y position, what the heading of the robot is. And we have to keep track of the drivetrain encoders and how fast we think they're going. So how fast we think this each side of the drivetrain is going. And we also have essentially what amounts to an integral error term. Um, but it's basically an estimate of is there some unknown force operating on the drivetrain? Is there ex more friction than our model thought there was? That sort of thing. Um, and this is all assuming that there's zero wheel slip and that the robot is not moving sideways. This is not accurate. The robot does move sideways. If you try to, if the driver pulls the trigger back too hard on our pistol grip controller, then the wheels will slip as they accelerate. Um, if they run into a wall and continue pushing the robot, then the wheels will slip. If there's no vision corrections, this will end up just dead reckoning based on encoders in the gyro yaw. That is actually a reasonable property, but it's not perfect. Um, and as I was alluding to earlier, that's what the robot Rio will do. It, I get the feeling there are probably questions. Can you clarify like, where the extended Coleman filter is coming in? Because I understand you're getting all these values, uh, and like they all come together, and then yeah. you're using the filter to do something with those values? And, like, what is the yeah, so in. On the localizer pi, we're getting a bunch of um, readings for what the IMU says and what the uh, tar where we think the targets are on the um, from f f relative to each pi. And so we run the uh, extended Coleman filter to say, oh, and I did not draw it on here. I should have. Um, there are also <laughs> that symbol clearly means voltages. Um, there are drivetrain voltages coming back from, we are from the Robo Rio saying, here's what voltages we applied to the drivetrain. And those are coming back up to the localizer. Um, and so we're running it on there to sort of, it, it will consume all those readings. Um, and as well as the drivetrain voltages for what we think the robot should be doing. Um, and as we do that, it'll end up with a result of that internal state that is the XY position that we feed back to the robot Rio. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to talk a bit more about how the corrections work, at least for uh, the vision. Basically, the, that, that vision processing produces a relative position and orientation for the camera compared to the target. Because the target is actually circular and sort of you can detect the curvature of the target, that gives you enough um, degrees of, enough constraints that you can actually figure out a lot of the orientation of the robot relative to the target. It doesn't give, because the target is circularly symmetric, it cannot tell you what side of the target you are on. Um, so that is basically the one degree of freedom you don't get. However, you get a lot of others. Um, one interesting note this year was we did not have great estimates of what the pitch and roll of the cameras on the robot were. Um, we could have gotten better estimates, but improving how you calibrate that is a ongoing effort. And we did not end up getting that calibration working great for this year. And so we need to work around that. Yes. And so what we, do I go to another? Yes. And so with that in mind, what is it that we care about? We care about shooting balls into the goal accurately. Um, so we care about where the distance from the catapult to the goal and the angle of the robot relative to the goal. And so we don't care about how the goal is pitched relative to the camera. We don't care about how the camera is rolled relative to the goal. We don't care about the camera's height relative to the goal because we're, we can reasonably confidently assume the robot is on the ground, um, at least when we're trying to shoot. You can actually find videos of mostly from 2019, the robot not always being on the ground, but those are hard to find. Actually, well, on the end of the match, it's easy to find, but during the match, it does happen. Um, so in order to reduce those effects, we did some math that we're not going to have time to pull up. Um, 
to basically get rid of those effects, we basically said, okay, we trust, and to handle the um, rotational symmetry, um, we said, okay, we trust the yaw from our estimator. Not because it's inherently perfect, but because the gyro is very good. It will drift by maybe a degree over the course of the match. So that's probably good enough. Um, and then based on that, and our current, yeah, based on that, we basically say, okay, where does this mean the camera thinks we are in X, Y, Z space? And then we ignored what it thought the role and pitch of the camera were because we didn't trust that we could translate those to the robot perfectly. One problem we actually ran into was that if we didn't get rid of that compensation, then if the camera, sorry, I'm to, oh, this diagram does it better. Um, if we thought the camera was pointed straight forwards, if we thought the camera was like this, and if the base of the robot is all the way down here, then what will happen is if you have an inaccurate pitch for the camera, where pitch is this angle being wrong, um, then the, we'll actually think that in this situation that the robot is over here, give or take. Because normally you would say, okay, this is where the, I do that wrong. This is where we think, if we have a reading for where this camera is, here's where we think the robot is. Um, when you have the camera pitch like this, what will happen is, oh, that's, I put this on the wrong side, my bad. The, we'll think the robot's over here because we have this long lever arm for how high up the robot or the camera is on the robot. And so we needed to actually just ignore this pitch reading. Um, and so that's what this item is talking about. Um, and lastly, to the point I was oh, talking about towards the beginning, I think, you want to be able to actually see what's going on. You're not meant to understand what's going on in this plot. This is just a demonstration. Um, we have put a lot of our effort into making it so we can actually figure out what is going on. This means we have logs that log every, all the data we can reasonably log. Basically, the only thing we don't log is full resolution image data. Um, and so we can have that full two kilohertz state of the IMU and the localizer being logged and we can see exactly what happened and then we can plot it. Um, we also, because we log all that information and we include the logging the results of the image processing, we can replay the full state of that localization and see, if, see what problems reoccur when we replay it. So if we saw a problem during a match and we weren't logging enough debug information, we can add that debug information, replay it in a simulation, and get that back. Or we can make changes and see if they fixed it when we replayed it in simulation. We also have this running um, during a match. And there's a lot of stuff here that isn't too important to this, but basically we have this lovely field graphic borrowed from the manual fit onto a web page. Um, and what happens is every time a vision correction comes in, we show where the camera thought the robot was, and then we fade it out over time so it's not cluttering up the rest of the page. And this actually gives us a lot of value to just sanity check what's happening. Does it look like camera readings are actually coming through or are the cameras not working? Um, does it look like the camera is in roughly the part of the field it should be? That sort of thing. What's the blue line and what's the red line? Uh, blue line is what direction the robot thinks is pointed since we, in our infinite wisdom, drew the robot dimensions accurately and the robot is close enough to a square, it's hard to tell which direction is forwards. And the red line is the same thing for the turret, so you can actually see what direction the turret is pointed. Yes? So this is full localization relative to the hoop? Um, I mean, it's on the field, but yes, what we care about is where we are relative to the hoop. Yes? Is this real-time data that the driver can use in order to um, see where the robot is? <sighs> One could. I don't think the drivers used it as much because if you're looking down at the laptop, you're getting distracted. Almost certainly. Um, if we were able to show like, oh, 
we, did, we have a ball detector and we detected a ball here, maybe it would be a bit more helpful. But even then, you probably wouldn't want the driver looking down at that. You might have um, the manipulator or the coach looking down at that to be able to direct the driver to where the balls are. Um, that gets to a sort of usability question of what, how do you make this maximally useful? And you, it, getting the driver distracted can be a bad thing. <laughs> this is more looked at by the coach. Yes? Are you logging ground truth? And if so, how are you determining ground truth? We don't have ground truth. <laughs> so when you're doing the analysis to see where things may have deviated, right, in a, in a replay or whatever, how are you determining whether or not there was a, a, uh, an error? There's three answers. One is it's hard. And that's something I'd like to improve, but we can only do so much. The second is you can actually tell a fair amount just from sort of looking at the data. You can say, okay, why did the robot think it was 500 meters away from the field? <laughs> like some problems you get are like that, where it's just, oh, you need the data to look sane at all. Um, and the third is you can get match video. In that second case where yeah. there's like a pretty major yeah. deviation, do you yeah. do any smoothing like in, in the algorithm? So that way it looks like all of a sudden the robot has jumped. Not... We, we do not explicitly do smoothing in the um, algorithm, but because of the nature of the way the Coleman filter works, a major correction will cause, will only have so much effect. However, we do have to do some outlier rejection um, because if we get a crazy reading, we'll just ignore it um, because sometimes we do. And we are actually technically past time, so I don't know what the state is, but one interesting question was in 2019, we had to do some work. We were able to take advantage of this to make it so you could place the hatches from any angle because you actually did not want to drive the robot straight at the center of the goal. I know we're slightly over time. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's like five minutes. Probably. Okay. But what would happen is if this were the hatch, just to pick a thing, um, Let's say this is the um, goal you're trying to hit. It's about the same width. What you want is for the hatch to end up like this, aligned with it perfectly, because that way the Velcro will engage. If you just make these go, if you're going straight at it, and you're slight, if you're slightly off and going straight at it, you can basically go at the center of the target with no issue. If you are approaching from the side, and you're going to the center of the target, like where my hand is, what will happen is you drive at it like this. The Velcro won't attach. What you want to do is you want to end up driving at to make this edge meet this edge. And so you want to drive it like this. And then the robot will sort of smush the um, hatch onto the target. And that is, it turns out, a lot easier to do when you have an XY estimate of the uh, robot on the field. And so that's what we did. It would have been much harder, it would have been much more obnoxious to do if we we're not producing an accurate XY estimate because then that would have made some of the math much more obnoxious to work through. Just an idea of sort of the types of thing you can types of things you can do with this sort of stuff. Uh, calibration is hard. Um, sort of if you have inconsistent lighting, if you have inconsistent field targets. If the field targets all look the same, that is very bad because then you can't tell which target you're looking at. That happened in 2019. That has not been an issue recently. And we, I think, already exhausted things. But any last questions? <laughs> yes? Uh, can we get this presentation online? And so let's see where I hope we, I believe we will be publishing the presentations alongside the videos. Um, and I've, I will make sure that that actually happens, at least for this one. <laughs> Is, I don't believe it's currently accessible. Yes. Do you know of any resources for getting people to understand some of the theory behind common filters? Um, I can add some to this presentation when it gets published. I don't know the best ones off the top of my head. Um, you can read Wikipedia, but that's not always great for introductions. <laughs> yeah, I know mean, there's you know, the control theory for FRC book, but that's very math heavy. So. Yeah, that I don't. I haven't looked at that recently. I don't know if it touches on Coleman filters at all. It does. Um, I read it. So. Okay, great. Um, but I don't think that would get into extended or unscented Coleman filters, probably. I believe it does. I okay. just remember it relying a lot on math that most high schoolers have not seen. Yes, it is an unfortunate thing about a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yes, I'll make sure some resources get added to this before we put it out so that 
because yes, that was obviously a source of uh, confusion that'd be good to resolve. <laughs>